Today, we're uncovering the secret history of Pepsi Man. The commercials, the video games, the merchandise. Everything you've ever wanted to know about Pepsi Man all in one documentary, including interviews, secrets, and newly discovered content that you can't find anywhere else. Are you excited? I'm excited. Let's do this. Pepsi Man Virtual. Pepsi Man is the name of a mascot character created by Pepsi Corporation's Japanese branch in the mid-1990s. He starred in a series of TV commercials that ran from 1996 to 2003. So what is Pepsi Man exactly? Well, he's a superhero, of course. Not only that, he's an American superhero, viewed from a uniquely Japanese lens. You'll notice that all of the actors in the Pepsi Man commercials are not ethnically Japanese and are instead a replica of Hollywood's white bread America. So what does Pepsi Man do? Well, in each of Pepsi Man's 15 to 30 second adventures, he rushes to the aid of the poor, thirsty public and delivers them some cool, refreshing Pepsi. Or rather manifests it out of thin air thanks to his one and only superpower. Along the way, he usually endures some sort of grievous harm to his body for comedic effect. If you knew all of this information already, then you're probably familiar with Pepsi Man in some capacity, and I think I know why. In 1999, a video game was developed for the Sony PlayStation, and no, it's, uh, it's not called Drink, it is in fact called Pepsi Man. This strange, clunky game was rediscovered by Americans around 2012, and then picked up by many notable YouTubers and celebrity gamers circa 2017, who then elevated it to cult status. Pepsi Man instantly gained a fanbase and became a well-recognized character in the United States. However, Pepsi Man was not the titular character's first foray into the world of video games. He had already made his gaming debut three years earlier in 1996 when he appeared in Fighting Vipers for the Sega Saturn. Apparently, Pepsi had struck a brand deal with Sega to include their new mascot in the game, however, this deal had some limitations. Pepsi product placements, including Pepsi Man, can only be found in the Japanese version of the game and are stripped from the international release. Pepsi Man is a hidden, unlockable character, rounding out a roster of more traditional fighting game archetypes. He's one of the only characters I've ever heard of that you unlock by losing the first battle with a perfect defeat. But somehow that just sounds right for the perpetually unlucky Pepsi Man. Fighting Vipers provides a faithful recreation of the character in-game and the Pepsi Man theme, a catchy tune performed by the Japanese band James and Gang, even plays when he wins a match. While I would like to get back to talking about Pepsi Man on the PSX, I'm obligated to mention the Pepsi Man arcade game. Pepsi Man had a Japan exclusive arcade cabinet, which is basically just a virtual version of Rock Paper Scissors with Pepsi Man as your opponent. Published in 1997 by Sigma Enterprises, this rare oddity of a game doesn't have much to it aside from three buttons, some cool pixel art, and some really crunchy sound bites. Pepsi Man on PlayStation is a bit notorious for being incredibly difficult and incredibly silly. It was produced by Kindle Imagine Develop, also known as KID, a now defunct Japanese software developer known for producing early visual novels, such as Chibi Maruko chan, Maruko Deluxe, Kiki Jo. You've definitely heard of that one, right? Kid filed for bankruptcy in 2006, helped in no part by the Pepsi Man game's poor sales figures, and yet, Pepsi Man still endures as a cult classic to this day. Pepsi Man on PlayStation is a straightforward auto-runner action game where the goal of each level is to simply reach the end without dying, which is much easier said than done. All right, so I am actually going to uh, try my hand at Pepsi Man, the game. Um, I have only played this once. Um, it's incredibly hard. I don't know exactly um, how I'm going to do, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Okay, okay. That's jump and, okay, uh, slide. Okay, I actually have not 
picked up so far, so that's good. Oh! Okay. <laughs> that was unexpected. Everything's trying to kill Pepsi Man. See, it's telling me to hurry. How do I hurry? How do I dash? I'm going to look this up. I need to learn how to dash immediately. Holding up and slide. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. 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 Nice. First try. <laughs> yeah. You're doing pretty good. Thank you. Escape from New York, Pepsi Man edition. Alright. You know? Sometimes it'd be like that. Okay. So far I'm actually doing <laughs> better than I thought I would. Yep. Whoa! <laughs> Pepsi Man. He's got some serious, serious jumps. Oh no. It's the Coke truck. Whoa, I did it! Nice! I will say, these invincibility frames are helping me. I spoke too soon. I missed the <laughs> checkpoint! Are you kidding me? Oh my... <sighs> oh my god. Oh my god. What? Whoa! Oh! 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 oh. <laughs> Jump. Okay. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good, folks. We're good. How was I supposed to know that was going to happen? Ooh. Okay. Run. Oh, sh Not the garbage cans again. Ah, whoa! Now, come on now. Oh, come on. Hmm. Give me Pepsi. I, uh, I quickly began realizing that beating Pepsi Man might be a little bit harder than I had initially anticipated. And so I decided to enlist the help of the former Pepsi Man speedrun world record holder and current owner of the domain PepsiMan.net, Twitch streamer, The Boyks. Hi, I'm The Boyks. I am a Twitch streamer, speedrunner, and I've played Pepsi Man live in front of an audience of 100,000 people plus twice. Amazing job, The Boyks, for your Pepsi Man run. So the very first thing that I wanted to ask my new Pepsi Man coach was, why did he subject himself to this in the first place? So Pepsi Man was, I think, my second or third game I picked up for speedrunning. Uh, and it started off as just a challenge to my friends uh, as, hey, here's this silly game. Let's all play it together and let's see who can beat it first. Uh, and Pepsi Man is a game that's also like extremely difficult, uh, sort of in that era where they just wanted to make tough games. Like <laughs> it still had the arcade mentality. But at the same time, there was something about it that was just really exciting and fun where it's just like it gives you that itch of just one more time just one more time i just want to go one more round that was so good part of it's the music the soundtrack for pepsi man admittedly one song the more i spoke with boix the more i realized that he's a bit of a pepsi man scholar himself pepsi man was actually extremely popular outside of america we're actually sort of just now realizing that and just finding it within the last 10 years because of youtube really and the addition of streaming. But if you look at it, uh, Pepsi Man was really popular, obviously in Japan, 
Uh, but it was also really popular in South America, where a lot of Japanese commercials played, including the Pepsi Man commercials, and also the Middle East, randomly. Uh, so outside of those three, uh, America didn't really hear about the character until these um, videos started coming out of like, hey, look at this silly thing that we never heard of, you know? While I always enjoyed chatting about Pepsi Man, what I really needed from Boix was some advice. I mean, I need help from an expert. There's no way I'm going to be able to beat Pepsi Man without some, you know, so, some insider knowledge. Um, the real trick I think that a lot of people, uh, well, the issue I should say that people run into and the trick relevant to it is that when you run in Pepsi Man, um, or if you do any input, a jump, a slide, it has to finish the complete animation of that motion before it accepts another input, otherwise it will eat it. So a lot of what people run into, where they're like, oh, the controls of this game suck, is because they're mashing <laughs> to like frantically try and do something. Um, but if you slow down and you do more of like a rhythmic input to the animation style, uh, then it becomes much more agreeable to what you're trying to do. A lot of it's memorization. Uh, the bosses are very easy once you've memorized where everything is. Then you could just, you know, move to each part of the screen. I don't even need to look at the screen typically. When I play those parts, I just read chat or whatever. So, <laughs> uh, But if you're playing it like a normal game and you're just frantically trying to react to everything, that's where the game gets difficult. One of the most unusual things about Pepsi Man The Game is its use of full motion video, or FMV, live action cutscenes in between levels featuring an unnamed American man. He provides some encouragement to keep you slogging through the hellscape of a game that is Pepsi Man as he lazes about eating potato chips, pizza, and drinking Pepsi. It's a strange addition, but a very welcome one in my opinion. Everybody Pepsi! Drink Pepsi! Pepsi. Only my choice. This mysterious American master of ceremonies is played by Canadian-born actor Mike Butters, who is also known for playing the character Paul in the Saw franchise. Mike Butters spent one day on set filming the scenes we enjoy in the game and was directed to act as ridiculous as possible. He was reportedly paid with a case of Pepsi for his efforts, and had completely forgotten about the project until his performance was once again in the public eye thanks to the cult resurgence of Pepsi Man. Mike Butters is not the only Canadian to show up while researching Pepsi Man. Canadian comic book artist Travis Cherist is often cited as the person who created Pepsi Man's iconic design. The character was designed in the mid-90s by Travis Cherist, but this is simply not true. Cherist was only hired to illustrate Pepsi Man for a new can design. He was provided character references, which means definitively that he did not design Pepsi Man. That raises a very big question. Who did? It took a little bit of research, but I was able to find a Wall Street Journal article from 1997 written by Yumiko Ono that reveals the identity of Pepsi Man's creator. Pepsi first decided on the superhero tactic in 1995, after the company's Tokyo marketers faced US ads that were particularly hard to translate. They decided to keep Pepsi's basic pitch, young, challenging, and American, and hired Takuya Onuki, a well-known advertising creator, to create a pitchman with those qualities. Mr. Onuki soon came up with a faceless superhero donning gleaming aluminum, who whispers, Shwa! the Japanese anemonopier for bubbles fizzling when he delivers a Pepsi. Pepsi man! Yeah! Takuya Onuki, graphic designer, art director, and advertising wizard. A quick Google search reveals that the man is both a prolific artist in the field of advertising and an award-winning legend in his field. A collection of his works, titled Advertising Is, Takuya Onuki Advertising Works 1980-2010, is a massive 
1,504 page full color compendium about the size of a brick, packed to the brim with striking prints of three decades of his work, as well as the text of the book, which has been referred to as an adventure novel of advertising. To be honest, it's pretty amazing how the book manages to make stills from a cup ramen advert look like they belong in a museum, but that just goes to show you the depth of Anuki-san's design skill. While browsing Japanese digital marketplaces for my own copy of the book, a description from one website really caught my eye. Here are the secrets of Pepsi Cola, Pepsi Man. Given the fact that Pepsi Man is such a famous, recognizable character to Western audiences, and yet his origin is a seemingly unknowable mystery to Anglophones around the globe, I knew I had to make it my sacred mission to discover the secrets of Pepsi Man one way or another. My initial instinct was to purchase Takuyo Nuki's book and hire someone to translate relevant sections of the work into English, but of course, a few problems arose. First, the book seems to be out of print and is incredibly difficult to find. At the time of recording, there's a copy on Amazon Japan being sold for 120,000 yen, or 1,155 US dollars. I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear that's a little bit outside of my budget. Evidently, it was completely sold out almost immediately upon release, and only a small number of copies were produced. Even if I wanted to spend over $1,000 on the book, the coronavirus pandemic has made ordering from overseas and getting an item shipped to the States pretty difficult. The used copy of the book on Amazon Japan is unavailable for shipment to the US. It seems the secrets of Pepsi Man are very closely guarded. But then a thought crossed my mind. What's preventing me from going straight to the source? And so my search for Takuya Onuki began. After some digging, I discovered that Onuki-san is currently employed by his alma mater, Tama Art University, and since 2015 he's been a member of the faculty in the graphic design department. Okay, but look at the architecture of this place. Initially, it seemed my only way of contacting Onuki-san was through the university, but sometimes fate extends its hand. So while I was moving forward with some other interviews that you'll see later in this video, I got in contact with an anonymous informant who worked very closely with Onuki-san on the Pepsi Man commercials, and they were able to get me a copy of the book. Now, before we dive into the contents of that book and discover Pepsi Man's origins, let's talk about those commercials. Pepsi Man! Pepsi. Sorry, sold out of Pepsi. Oh, no. Pepsi Man! Let's get out of here. Pepsi Man! Whoa. Oh, wow. It may be easy to forget, given all the hype in the US around Pepsi Man as a video game character, but he got his start on TV. It was Pepsi Man's funny and unique TV commercials that launched him to popularity in Japan, and without his domestic fame, he never would have become a global icon of advertising. But I'd like to mention that before there was Pepsi Man, there was Pepsi Man. You may think that this is a Tim and Eric sketch, but no, that isn't Tim Heidecker. That's Paul Rodriguez, the OG Pepsi Man. This commercial aired in Mexico in 1993. Doesn't have much to do with our beloved mascot, but I thought it would make for an interesting footnote. As far as I can tell, there are at least 15 Pepsi Man commercials that were produced over the years for the campaign. A lot of the footage you've been seeing throughout this video are those adverts. You may have noticed that the quality of these videos is much higher than anywhere else on the internet. So many of the Pepsi Man videos readily available elsewhere online were uploaded nearly a decade ago on the earliest form of YouTube, where every video was compressed into 240p digital slush. And a lot of those videos are rips from VHS tapes, further increasing the generation loss. 
Luckily, I was able to uncover lost HD copies of the commercials, which you are now seeing for the first time outside of Japanese television. I'd like to point out one rare video in particular titled Corvette, which features Pepsi Man's voice. He speaks Japanese with an incredibly heavy American accent. Pepsi Cola a big chance. All of the Pepsi Man ads follow a basic formula. Someone is in dire need of some Pepsi. Pepsi Man rushes to the rescue. And then Pepsi Man injures himself, delivering us some classic slapstick comedy. One clever detail is that at the end of each ad, the Pepsi can that appears on screen reflects the condition of Pepsi Man at the end of the video. This gives Pepsi Man himself a sort of anthropomorphic quality. He's basically just the physical manifestation of a can of Pepsi. But Pepsi Man is not the only anthropomorphic Pepsi character featured in this campaign. We also have Pepsi Man Twist who wears a yellow balaclava on his head to represent the lemon-flavored cola drink. And finally, there's Pepsi Woman, who represents Diet Pepsi Twist. She's basically what you'd expect from a Japanese female CGI character, jiggle physics and all. Since Pepsi Man was a playable character in Fighting Vipers, maybe Pepsi Woman can get into Dead or Alive. I shall be your opponent. We settle this. Get ready, fight! It may not be obvious at first glance, given the low resolution of many of the Pepsi Man videos available online, but Pepsi Man is indeed a fully CGI character. Referring back to that Wall Street Journal article, Yumiko Ono wrote, To make the ads look as if they were really popular in the US, according to Miss Yanase, a spokesperson for PepsiCo Japan, Pepsi hired Lucas Industrial Light and Magic, a computer graphics company owned by movie producer and director George Lucas, to create the high-tech images of Pepsi Man. And that brings us to our next person of interest, Wade Howey. Thought we were done talking about Canadians? Wade Howey is an acclaimed Canadian visual effects artist and animator who currently heads the VFX department at Van Arts in Vancouver. In the late 90s, he was working for George Lucas at ILM. I was lucky to spend 12 years at uh, Industrial Light and Magic in the early days. So that was sort of took me through Terminator 2, uh, Jurassic Park, The Mask, Casper, the uh, Star Wars prequels. Moved over into directing commercials, and I got a lot of international awards for uh, doing commercials with big animation and effects uh, components. Yep, you guessed it, one of those international commercial campaigns that Wade supervised was Pepsi Man. In fact, he directed and served as the VFX supervisor for over a dozen commercials. Now, I was actually lucky enough to sit down with Wade for an interview so that he can share his insight on the process. Hi, I'm Wade Howey. Uh, I was uh, in various capacities director, animation director, and visual effects supervisor uh, for the Pepsi Man spots that were done at Industrial Light and Magic. Now, the first thing that I wanted to know was, you know, just go with the basics. How did the VFX team at ILM actually develop the Pepsi Man character that we see in the commercials? Yeah, so developing the character at first, uh, we had sketches and we went through the process. At ILM, we used to do a, build a physical model for everything. Mm. Never just go from drawings to CG. They went through a lot of, they kept wanting more muscle, more muscle. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then um, when the chain came on, that was it was a neat little effects challenge figuring out how to make the chain work. So we didn't have quite as sophisticated tools then on the animation side. Uh, the modeling um, uh, done in uh, Alias, you know, which people know as Maya now. Animation was done in uh, Soft Image. Uh, the shading and uh, the lighting is all Render Man. What Render Man came out of Lucasfilm, both uh, Pixar and ILM had a, a deal each kept a source code of it, and then they give each other updates. It was classy stuff. 
slow. <laughs> As the VFX supervisor, Wade was in charge of making Pepsi Man come to life, but these commercials were truly born from the mind of Anuki-san. Takuya Onuki served as creative director, and his associate Hideki Kuroda served as art director. The two of them spearheaded the project in collaboration with Japanese production company Pyramid Film and the American company ILM. Uh, Pepsi corporate, there would occasionally be some people from their uh, ad agency um, standing around in the background, a couple of people in suits. And, but uh, Onuki-san was so um, like famous or celebrated or whatever that no one ever said anything to him. And it was like, it was his show. We dealt directly with uh, Onuki and Kuroda. Uh, Kuroda and Onuki were sort of, I, know, I got the, the impression that they were independent working through Pyramid Films. The, the agency uh, was very hands-off. Through talking with Wade, I was able to discover so much about the production of these Pepsi Man commercials. I came to find out that this truly was Onuki-san's project. He wanted to portray America from his own pop culture lens. Now, <laughs> through all of this, I wasn't too surprised to learn that Onuki-san is a huge fan of Quentin Tarantino's work, and that he actually worked with him on a commercial that aired in Japan. タラおじちゃんまで。タラちゃんです。はい。電話だ。タラいる。奥さんよ。タラ。タラちゃんです。はい。はい。おいおい。携帯に繋ぐスピーカーもらえます。<笑> But if I gotta be honest, if I were to compare Anuki-san to an American director, I would probably choose Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick was known for being a rather demanding director and let's just say very particular about what he wanted to see on camera. And Onuki-san seems to be the exact same way. Wade actually shared a story with me where uh, the, the team had to film a Pepsi can spinning over 100 times just to get the movement perfectly right. They were, they, were, they were going for lots of like Americana, it was mixed bag of Americana. They really liked to, uh, they would pick out a spot that had to be where they were going to shoot and couldn't ever come up with any compromise on it. And it was usually a pretty expensive option. Or in some cases, like, three locations necessitating a three-day shoot for a 30-second spot. Onuki and Kuroda would come up with uh, an image that said, this is this is exactly where we have to do this. Hmm. And that would drive all the planning and budgeting. <laughs> Unlike most commercials, which are shot on a soundstage or California backlot, the Pepsi Man spots were sort of snapshot of the United States. The crew crisscrossed the country shooting on location in New York, Colorado, Florida, Mexico, and of course, California. Wade also had some pretty wild stories from the set of Pepsi Man. Oh yeah, like we actually uh, rented a truck, took out insurance on it and drove it into things in LA. One of the collisions got out of control and a bunch of materials went flying over a high fence and landed into landed in a parking lot and took out two cars as well as damaging the, the truck that we were driving into things. So, uh, like we set up all these props for it to drive through and then some stuff that wasn't really props that sort of at the last minute someone thought would be cool. <laughs> that's, that's crazy, and, uh, wow. We, we ran over a camera, we just destroyed a, ca destroyed a camera, two cars, and uh, we messed up the truck we rented. I also learned from Wade that there was a lost Pepsi Man commercial that was canceled midway through production. <sighs> How to describe? There's, I don't know, there's Japanese character of Dirty Old Man. This was uh, a woman singing in the shower. Pepsi Man comes and throws open the shower curtain, reaches in his hand to do the schwa, and... Uh, yep, you heard that right. Pepsi Man was planning on doing his own version of that classic boob grabbing gag that you see all the time in anime and other Japanese media. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
it, uh, it got to a point where a bunch of the women on the crew started complaining about doing the spot and ended up not being produced. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't see that going over too well. Speaking of scantily clad women, Wade also shared a story of how one of the most famous Playboy models ever was almost in a Pepsi Man commercial. Anna Nicole Smith was uh, supposed to come and uh, audition. Anna Nicole Smith uh, never did show up for the audition, actually. But after I had left to go back to back up to San Francisco, they did contact her somewhere and bring her in and uh, shot a tape of her uh, her audition to be in uh, Pepsi Man. About a week later, we ended up going with, uh, I guess it's when we got Angelica Bridges in on the spot from uh, Baywatch. But um, I ended up sitting uh, across from her on a plane to, from uh, Burbank to Oakland. Wade was such an invaluable resource for this documentary, and so I'd just like to take the time now to thank him for his contributions. But if you think that our deep dive into Pepsi Man ILM crew is over, uh, think again, because now we're going to speak with... Uh, Paul Hill. I am a visual effects producer, and uh, I produced though, the first dozen Pepsi Man commercials. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I, I thought about wearing my Pepsi Man sweatshirt but I oh that's great at the moment but uh, i do have one so if we ever, if we ever just <laughs> um i will not be however modeling my pepsi man boxer shorts which are were wow <laughs> best crew gift ever before i could even ask any questions paul just immediately started bombarding me with the entire pepsi man production timeline which is awesome Pepsi Man, when it first started, um, it was the very first thing I actually produced. I had been a production coordinator and I got bumped up to be a producer to take on uh, the Pepsi Man campaign. We uh, shot that first one in, in Fremont, California. We did, uh, we shot on the streets of Fremont from day before Christmas. Um, and then we shot on stage with the, with the, the the interior shots of that. That's the one with the little boy screaming Corvette, the one that we shot. Um, that's at a place in Palm Desert called Club Ed. It has a gas station and a restaurant. And once you sort of see it, you will see that it is in so many movies and so many wow. commercials because there is nothing else around it. It is just an old gas station. And this guy just bought it and you just rents it out for film shoots. And it's uh, great. That was the odd one where you could win a Corvette if you um, had the right, if you got the right can of Pepsi. Uh, then there's a beach with the five girls on the beach. That was really difficult because in the end, you know, we, we sent people out for days trying to get the right wave and we couldn't ever find the wave that looked like the one that he had seen in a movie. So we just bought the rights to that footage and we got rid of the person that's in the shot and we put Pepsi Man over top of it. Paul also had some insight into Onuki-san's creative process that led to the birth of Pepsi Man. The way Mr. Onuki described it was that when you heard cola, you thought Coke, and that was it. That was all you ever thought of. And so he wanted people to think in Japan. He wanted people to think Pepsi. He wanted there to be something different. So that's why he started inventing this character, which evidently was very successful. Their sales certainly went up. Um, we had a little issue, I think after the, I think it's after the first four, um, they changed the can, they redesigned the can and it was no longer silver, it was blue. So that's why Pepsi Man gets a new outfit. So there is, a, is the sizzle spot online. It is just 15 seconds of Pepsi Man drinking. Yes, that one I found on uh, on Nico video, on the Japanese so that is the, That is the introduction of the new can and the new outfit. So that's why so suddenly Pepsi Man had to be that blue slash. So all of our all of our Pepsi, our old Pepsi Man crew gift was 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 out of date suddenly because you know he didn't have the the red down the middle anymore. But yeah, but that was part of the big goal was when you think of cola, don't think of red, think of blue. So that was that was the function of changing the the outlook of the can. Paul told me what it was like working with Onuki San, who is incredibly revered in his home country of Japan. I mean, Paul even described him as a national treasure. So because of that, 
he, you know, we we did not know him particularly, but they did certainly. And so no one on his group could ever say no to him, no matter what his idea was. So it sort of fell to uh, us to say no to him when the idea was too far, it was just not possible to do. But, you know, one of the reasons why we worked together so well was that I would do what we could to make what he wanted happen. So uh, have you seen the dance spot? I think it's called Dispenser, where there's a retro dispenser for Coke, for Pepsi, and they're all doing that dance. Yep. So that's the first mocap Pepsi man. Mm -hmm. And they were dead set against mocap for Pepsi man. Uh, I didn't think my animators would be able to animate Pepsi man dancing well enough. I just, it's just, it's very, in those days, that was still very, very difficult. I, the reason they were dead set against the motion capture is because the only motion capture they knew was the Uga Chaka baby from Ally McBeal. Okay, I gotta be honest, I've never actually seen that clip before, um, until just now. Um, I mean, I've seen the dancing baby meme before, but I had no idea what the source of it was. I gotta be honest, in context, it's it's not any better. That is, that is so cursed. W what the hell? So, luckily, we had done a spot with three motion capture figures dancing. Uh, for another uh, uh, agency, for another uh, uh, client. And I was able to show them that even when the figure stands still, it breathes in an odd way that, 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 that helped you buy the fact that it was live. And so they were so impressed with that, that didn't look like the Uga Chaka baby, that uh, uh, they went with it and they were really, really pleased with it. Obviously, Pepsi Man's dancing, while maybe a little bit janky by modern standards of animation, is not like that. Uh, boxing, which is the one we shot in New York. So uh, that was flying to New York. There's this one spot, um, um, which is under, you know, under the, the um, highway. Yeah. yeah, no, it, we're by the Brooklyn Bridge. The, that, okay. that was easy to shoot. There's <laughs> another shot where we're going through, and there's the trellis. And I'm trying to think of the name I of the road. I, yeah, I think another shot you're talking about. Because he's running along under there. Yeah. Um, that. Oh, yeah, we, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that was totally pirated. There was a U Haul place right there. I had to give them $300 in cash just to, for as a deposit. But we rented a $19 U Haul truck and shot out the back of the truck, just driving up and down the street for an hour. And so it cost me $20 plus the rest of the group, but to get that shot. Then the, the, the actual boxing portion of it is shot on stage uh, to ILM. So we built that. That's a, a set that we built. One of the issues was always trying to. Um, we would always have to operate the door to fly open. Whatever we did, we'd have to puppeteer that door so that to make it work on time because it was. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I think we did hamburger next. That's the one where they're in the hamburger stand and they're oh, sold right. out of. Yes, I know we're talking about that. One. We went to at least twenty-five hamburger stands in Los Angeles looking for the right one because <laughs> yeah. you know. They, they'd get an idea in there, they'd see something that they'd like and they'd try to find it. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot. I forgot the cactus one. But they, you know, because we, we tried to get them to the, the, the dunes, you know, outside of L.A. because it would be so convenient. It was so easy and they, they look exactly the same, but they did not look exactly the same to them. Uh, they hated every cactus we ever built for them. So they built that cactus themselves and brought it over in... Um, his producer uh, booked a first-class flight and brought it on his as his luggage. I mean, and it's it's like, you know, twelve feet tall. I mean, it was in a huge crate, but he came on the plane uh, from Japan with that cactus because we'd keep sending them samples, and it's like, no, no, just didn't like it. So <laughs> they just built it themselves.
We shot the one in in Miami, the one where he dives off the off the roof of the building. That was uh, that was uh, uh, certainly an interesting adventure. And um, I don't know, did did Wade tell you that the the actress in that was one of the actresses from uh, the one where they're at the beach? Yeah, the uh, Baywatch. Yeah, Baywatch. Yeah, it also been at Baywatch, right? So she had her career had taken a a, a, a step up during that time. Ooh, going back to the one at the beach, um, it's hard to tell, but it is so cold at the beach that day. I'm gonna guess it's in the low 50s. So all of these girls are lying on the beach in their bikinis and we're trying to make it look hot. Um, we even have a little flame bar in front of the camera to make heat waves rise up <laughs> in front of them, make it look hotter than it is. And we're blowing hot air on them, but they are so cold. <laughs> We used to joke that it was often the same crew would work on everything, uh, but that w there'd always be at least one new person on the team. And the new person would always be so startled at, at some of the requests that would come from the client. And we were used to it by then. I mean, we had, we, we when we were shooting the beach one, I think they got, I believe they had over 200 uh bikinis they had them in every color in every style wow. for each one of the different girls so that they could decide what they what they wanted paul had such incredible insight into the production process of the pepsi man campaign and uh while we were talking there were two people in particular uh that he mentioned that i'd like to bring up now uh one of them is charleston pierce um, who was Pepsi Man's stand-in and body double. And the other is uh, Miki Kuratani, um, who was the sort of liaison between the American company ILM and the uh, Japanese production company Pyramid Film. Have you heard about Mirinda Man? I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's, uh, stealing or if it's uh, real, but uh, Mirinda is a soft drink in the Philippines and they stole several of our commercials and just changed the composite on Pepsi Man to make him into Mirinda Man. But it was even, even sang this, they even sang the same song. I think that's an official ripoff. I think they were allowed to do that. I, I don't know why, but somehow, because we were horrified by it because it was our work and they were like, you know, which has this note hideous compositing on, on, on his chest. Just like Wade mentioned earlier, Paul also brought up the fact that Onuki-san was a bit of a perfectionist and he really, really had some specific requests in terms of what he wanted to see on camera. I can't remember now which one it is. Maybe it's the hamburger joint, but for one of them, he wanted it to be reminiscent of Police Academy 5. It's like, wait, Police Academy 5? <laughs> And, and so we would get these odd cultural references like, OK, yeah, because he had seen it and he saw something in it that he wanted. And we so, OK, that's the reference we're looking for. And, you know, and when it would when it would work, they would get so excited. They would be so pleased. by You know, but it's like, you know, we'd get these things like, could you make it? 11.3 percent bigger. It's like, mm, OK. <laughs> <laughs> they were, and I would say, do you like it? And they go, go is it 11.3% bigger? And I would say, do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> and this was always my goal when I was a producer. I always wanted to give the client uh, something better than they thought they were going to get. Hmm. And I think we did that with Pepsi Man. I think we gave them some really amazing work. I mean, we did, you know, it, it was fun for people to work on, um, you know. It would be frustrating sometimes, as as, as they will all admit, everybody, especially your first time on this plot, on, on the on the series, when an odd request would come in and nobody else would blink an eye, and a new person would go, "What?" It's like, yeah, yeah, just yeah, yeah. They brought their own cactus. No, it's not a problem. Before we wrapped up our conversation, Paul let me in on a little secret. Why does Pepsi Man say schwa? So uh, Pepsi Man says schwa, because yes, it is the sound of a can opening and it's supposed to make you thirsty. But Mr. Onuki told us when we first asked about it, because it was a little, you know, it was again, this is a, a word like, what does it mean? What did, and he says, well, it's like a short slangy way of saying konnichiwa, like chwa. I'm just, he's saying hello and making you thirsty. So 
I'd like to take the time now to thank Paul uh, for all of his help on this project and for providing uh, me with all of these incredible behind the scenes photos that you've uh, been seeing throughout this segment. But we're not done yet. We got one more speaker to go. Hi, I'm Doug McMillan, and I was the CG supervisor on Pepsi Man back in the 1990s when I was at Industrial Light and Magic. Doug also provided some of the photos that you've been seeing throughout this segment, and he gave me this rare, never seen before behind the scenes footage from the set of the Pepsi Twist commercial. Ready, add, action. I've never experienced a client that uh, works with such precision as uh, a pyramid. Uh, that there would always be instructions about altering something that was six foot big by, you know, the quarter inch uh, adjustments. And um, well, we thought at Industrial Light Magic, we were the king of minutia. We used to joke that ILM, the M stood for minutia and I love was the other part. Now, you might think that working with someone who's such a perfectionist might be sort of a nightmare, uh, but apparently it was the total opposite. No, it, w it wasn't uh, bad at all. Everybody always loved working on it and um, uh, th there seemed to be, all it could have been Paul Hill's great uh, uh, producer um, uh, work being done uh, behind the scenes. Um, but there was always enough time to get things done and they'd anticipate that we would need time for their very precise and um, uh, persnickety uh, uh, details that they wanted to see. But it is a branding thing and um, we were up for it. We, we knew that that was part of the package, um, but um, and speaking of package, some of the anatomical uh, uh, details about Pepsi Man were, and Pepsi Woman for that matter, were always paramount in, in um, precision. Doug McMillan was also able to provide me uh, some insight into how Pepsi Man actually traded hands between production companies towards the end of the campaign. It went from ILM to another production company, a VFX house called The Orphanage. There was a decision made that ILM was to shrink down and, and simplify uh, some of the projects that they were doing. So any of the oddball uh, things like the ones we thrived on, Paul Hill and I, and uh, Paul Griffin, uh, another one of the, the team, we unfortunately were delivered some very disruptive news at the last minute just before we were going to have some uh, dealings with our client and that was this is all shutting down. There was some folks that we knew fairly well over at the orphanage uh, who are ex-ILM people anyway so it was like keeping it in the family and uh, Paul and I Fortunately, went along with the, um, the client and the, the crew down to Los Angeles to uh, do that final production uh, that was an overlap, a transitional stage between Industrial Light Magic and the Orphanage. 
and um, it went surprisingly well and we really enjoyed uh, um, giving the client a nice send off to their new home. It was a very short-lived home because the Pepsi Man campaign uh, ended shortly after the orphanage took over. Uh, in fact, I think the only commercial that they produced entirely themselves is uh, the one at the construction site. <sighs> Look, it's Pepsi Man! Hey, Pepsi Man! Pepsi Man! Pepsi Man! <laughs> Lemon ga bejushi! Pepsi Twist! Fun fact, you might think that the Pepsi Man PlayStation game was referencing this commercial, but it's actually the other way around. This spot was made well after the Pepsi Man game was released. Also, I would really like to thank Doug uh, for this. Um, he actually gave me this awesome Pepsi Man uh, production shirt from uh from ilm i'm guessing this was like a crew gift or something like that yeah so i don't know if you can see here it's it's a little bit too big uh for me um but it's really really awesome you can see here uh it's got it's got a patch right here it says pepsi man ilm uh pepsi man patch right here which uh says industrial light and magic commercial productions um, which is really, really cool. Um, and hey, even though I can't wear it, I mean, this is such, such a cool, like, piece of memorabilia in the history of both Pepsi Man and ILM, for that matter. Now, before we move on, I would like to mention really quick uh, that I just recently started a Patreon. Um, so if you are really enjoying this documentary, you appreciate the work that I put in, um, and you would like to support the channel financially, uh, please just consider checking it out. Um, there's a link in the description below, and uh, I would really, really appreciate it. So far, we've heard a lot about this mysterious creator of Pepsi Man, Takuya Onuki, from other people, colleagues that he's worked with in the past but only he knows exactly what was going on in his mind as he created the character, and luckily he shared that insight in his book, Advertising Is. Imagine for a moment, Japan in the mid-1990s. Coca-Cola absolutely dominated the cola industry in the country, and PepsiCo was just trying to chip away at Coca-Cola's monopoly. Despite their best efforts and positive market research results, Pepsi sales just didn't seem to be doing well. I mean, Coke seemed to be at the top of their game. Just listen to this commercial. Pepsi Japan decided to fire back by hiring the legendary art director Takuya Onuki and finally do something about it. Every superhero needs a proper origin story, so now I present to you Pepsi Man's humble origins in Onuki-san's own words, translated and voiced by my friend Noriko Sato. The first thing I wanted to do when I started this job was to go to a convenience store that actually sold Pepsi. On the way home from work, I went to see how Pepsi products looked at the store. The moment I saw the Pepsi cans that are lined up inside of the clear refrigerator case, I thought, Pepsi can be selling this way? The only way it can sell is to make the cans red! When Japanese people want to drink cola, they only reach for Coca-Cola's red cans. The only cola is red Coca-Cola. Red Coca-Cola on bar signs. Red Coca-Cola on vending machines. Red Coca-Cola at McDonald's. Since their childhood, Japanese people are completely programmed to think that cola is just red Coca-Cola. In fact, throughout the world, the country where Coca-Cola overpowers Pepsi the most is Japan. It sounds like a joke, but I really thought that if I didn't make Pepsi cans red, they wouldn't sell. However, in reality, we couldn't do that. Then what could I do? 
I had to make a commercial that would make the product itself popular. So then I thought, that talent has to be the product itself. Pepsi Man, I thought. Not very clever, but so easy to understand. Plus, it communicates its message super fast. A Pepsi can will become the character. Body is aluminum. Faces, well, if it has a face, then it becomes another character. Okay, then it doesn't need a face. Okay, okay, sounds good. Let him wear a chain on his neck. Let's make Pepsi Man and make everybody love him. Let's make him popular. Then as a result, the product should become popular. I thought all of this within the first one or two minutes as I stood in front of the fridge case. That's right. Pepsi Man was conceived within minutes in Onuki-san's mind as he stood in a convenience store staring at some cans of Pepsi. Seems appropriate. But still, Onuki-san needed to find that X factor. The one thing that will set Pepsi Man apart from other mascots and make him endearing and popular. Eventually, he figured it out. Pepsi Man couldn't just be a cool superhero character, he must be funny. A self-deprecating and sort of pathetic superhero. Comedy was the missing ingredient, as Onuki-san puts it. So, I thought that if I add humor on top of the cool factor, then Pepsman will definitely be loved by everyone. For example, the audience starts watching a commercial and they think Pepsman looks really cool. But then he farts. What if I made the character something like that? While farting Pepsi Man never did seem to make the cut, the basic premise was solidified. Anuki-san expanded on this by introducing a new radical idea for the final product image, that is, a negative image. In other words, anti-advertising. Now, if you're kind of curious about anti-advertising and you'd like to see more about uh, some bizarre uh, commercial mascots, feel free to check out my video on the Slim Jim guy. Onuki-san explains his comedic product image idea like this. For instance, if Pepsi Man hits his head at the end of the commercial, we would use the dented Pepsi can as the final product image. Normally, we want to use a beautiful Pepsi can as the product image. But by using this self-deprecating product image, it will overlap with Pepsi Man's persona. This self-deprecating approach to advertising has had success in the past. I predicted that by using this technique in a major brand's commercial, it would give people a huge shock and get an even bigger reaction. Onuki-san further expanded on his idea and made Pepsi Man an American superhero. Since Coca-Cola was domestically recognized as Japan's official cola brand, he felt that by positioning Pepsi as an American brand, it may draw interest to the product. In the States, we might find this kind of ironic since they're both American brands, but Pepsi intended to use its foreign import status to its advantage. Onuki-san went so far as to conceal his involvement in the campaign entirely and pretend that the Pepsi Man commercials really were made in the USA. During the Pepsi Man campaign, at the time, I didn't disclose that I was involved at all. We didn't want to let people know that it was a Japan-only campaign because we wanted to spread the idea to Japanese people that Pepsi Man is super popular all around the world. So I acted like an American creator, making the commercials for an American audience. The Pepsi Man campaign was a huge hit in Japan, and domestic sales of Pepsi skyrocketed. The campaign was so popular, in fact, that Pepsi companies in other countries picked it up. It really did become a worldwide campaign. It spread throughout Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and Europe, and was even supposed to air in the United States. But, of course, that plan fell through. As I mentioned earlier, the Pepsi Man TV commercials really were Onuki-san's creation. The supporting teams at ILM and Pyramid Film were just there to bring his vision to life. So you might be wondering, what was Onuki-san's creative process? I always thought of the last scene of a Pepsi Man commercial first. I would start by asking, how bad do I treat this Pepsi can? And work backwards from there. For example, if I come up with the idea to make the Pepsi can in the product shot upside down, then I think, how can I make Pepsi Man end up upside down? First, I listed all my ideas of that last product shot and then came up with stories about Pepsi Man for each of those ideas. 
I brought those ideas and met up with Kuroda-san at a family restaurant late one night. Using a simple commercial structure as our base, we came up with so many fun ideas. The more commercials we made, the better that the ILM team and us understood each other. I even thought, can a job be this much fun? In Onoki-san's book, he includes concept art and storyboards for Pepsi Man spots that were never produced. In some cases, I'm not very surprised that they weren't greenlit. They get surprisingly dark, but personally, I think they're awesome. Time to get a taste of this lost Pepsi Man media. In one spot, we see a truck driver driving along a road at night in the middle of an American desert gulping from thirst. A haze appears in front of him, and Pepsi Man materializes. But before Pepsi Man can say schwa, he's run over by the truck and flattened. The truck driver is happy now that he has his Pepsi, but Pepsi Man gets run over again, just in case. Poor Pepsi Man. In another spot, we see a room full of gangsters grumbling from thirst. Then Pepsi Man busts through the wall. He tries to make Pepsi materialize like usual, but the Pepsi won't pop out today. He tries again, but nothing works. Pepsi Man quickly tries to make his escape, but he's riddled with machine gun bullets as he rushes away. It's pretty unsurprising that these Pepsi Man spots didn't make the cut, uh, considering a lot of them involve Pepsi Man getting killed. And of course, we can't forget about that lost commercial that Wade Howey mentioned earlier. Its storyboard reveals that it was an Alfred Hitchcock parody, with references not just to Psycho, but to Vertigo as well. In this storyboard, we see that Pepsi Man ends up in handcuffs. This premise was actually recycled for the Pepsi Twist ad years later. It's really amazing to get inside the mind of Anuki-san, and also to have access to these materials which are being seen for the first time ever outside of Japan, and for the first time ever in English. Now, I'd like to mention that Onuki-san was not just involved in the uh, production of the Pepsi Man commercials, but he was also intimately involved in the creation of all Pepsi Man merchandise. And yes, you heard me, all Pepsi Man merchandise. For licensing, we were expected to make a Pepsi Man manual with photos, illustrations, logos, typesets, and instructions to make products according to the manual. But that doesn't necessarily guarantee the products we want. It would only eat a Pepsi Man's fortune. So instead, I decided to include in the licensing terms and conditions that I personally must be involved in the supervision and designing of every item. I would started this deal where if you want to make any Pepsi Man items, it would come with my supervision and designing. Obviously, this is a highly unusual decision. As Onuki-san mentions, usually for IP licensing, a company will create a quality control manual that any licensees will have to adhere to. But instead, Onuki-san decided to directly supervise all Pepsi Man licensed products. And yes, that includes the PlayStation game. I think this is a perfect segue into our next topic. Pepsi Man, like all advertising mascot characters, exists purely to sell things. Obviously, he exists to sell Pepsi, but things get meta when we think about all of the Pepsi Man merch that exists. Of course, there's t-shirts, toys, random objects, and unlicensed posters from Redbubble, but Boyks actually helped me out by recommending Japanese export website Sendico for some unusual Pepsi Man merch. Some of those rare Pepsi Man treasures include a keychain figure, Showa-era retro pins, a Windows 95 desktop character, and a Toko Toko can helper. Whatever the hell a can helper is. Now I'd like to talk about two exceptionally peculiar pieces of Pepsi Man merch. Exhibit A, Pepsi Man Bottle Caps. Pepsi Man Bottle Cap! An article from Sora News 24 from 2012 talks about the unique Pepsi Man merchandise that started a nationwide trend. Anyone who frequents the Japanese convenience store beverage case has probably noticed that some bottled drinks occasionally come packaged with collectible figurine. 
some of which double for actual bottle caps. Well, did you know that the first character to ever appear atop a Japanese bottle cap was the thirst quenching superhero? Pepsi Man? In 1998, Pepsi Japan began packaging limited edition Pepsi Man bottle caps with their beverages as part of a promotional campaign. The campaign was a huge success and other beverage makers soon followed suit. These prize collectibles pioneered a trend. Leave it to our aluminum hero to be a trailblazer. Hi! Pepsi 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 Man Big Bottle Cap Presents. Get Pepsi Man Big Bottle Cap! Onuki-san writes about his involvement in the creation of the Pepsi Man bottle caps in Advertising Is. At the time, it seemed like figurines in American comics were on the rise in popularity. So I thought, what if we put a little Pepsi Man figure on top of a bottle cap? It will be super eye-catching and charming, I thought. People will be surprised to see little Pepsi Man figures lined up in the convenience store fridges. People will definitely want to buy a Pepsi. I will make this the superstar of the bonus gifts world. By using the Pepsi Man bottle caps, let's make bottle caps a trend. The first series of Pepsi Man bottle caps theme was sports. As a toy fanatic, I helped design each of the little figurines with prototype creator Ken-san and Hayabe-san. I put the same energy and effort into these designs that I would put into a commercial production. The popular bottle caps made people want to collect them. And so we increased the varieties and even made commercials for it. Now let's talk about Exhibit B. If you thought those Pepsi Man bottle caps were weird, allow me to introduce the fucked of Pepsi Man. You may think I'm cursing at you, but no, that is actually the name of a Pepsi Man action figure created by Bandai in 1998. Bizarre name aside, the action figure supposedly even smells like Pepsi Cola. I can only imagine what carcinogens were combined to create that aroma. But what is fucked supposed to mean anyway? Well, we know for sure that it's not fact. There are many theories floating around. Perhaps fucked is a reference to the LA clothing brand Fucked, founded in 1990, or perhaps it stands for failed under continuous testing. Whatever it's supposed to mean, it seems PepsiCo Japan may have made a slight oversight in how English speakers would react to the toy. The box for this action figure also features the only official bio for Pepsi Man given by the company. Pepsi Man is such a refreshing guy that he delivers Pepsi Cola to thirsty people. He can pop up Pepsi Cola with schwa action and deliver them around everywhere. According to reliable sources, he is a promoter of Pepsi Cola company. And Pepsi Man is also such an athlete that he is good at all kinds of sports, such as surfing, snowboarding, skateboarding, etc. He is very confident of his physical ability. In closing, I'd like to return to the words of Anuki-san. After a corporate shakeup at Pepsi Japan that removed a close friend from their position and undermined Anuki-san's years of dedication to the Pepsi Man campaign, Anuki-san lost a lot of trust in Pepsi. He decided to end his partnership with the company and the Pepsi Man campaign. It's difficult to build a trusting relationship with a big company when I can't even see their individual faces. Maybe I'm asking too much. But I want to work with a company where I can see their faces. I want to share the same goal with them. At that moment, I thought, I won't help out a company that just wants to sell things. Before, I was acting like a cool art director saying things like, advertisement is just a business to sell products. But we advertisers should sell products with more personal conviction. I started thinking, when we think about the good of society and our customers' happiness, our products will sell as a result. Now, that's the right mindset for a company. I couldn't agree more, Onuki-san. And with that, sadly, that brings our Pepsi Man journey to a close. Um, but I can confidently say that we did discover the secret history of Pepsi Man. If you think this video deserves a like, please hit that like button. It really helps. If you like the content on this channel and you'd like to see more in the future, uh, then please hit subscribe and ring that bell. 
And if you'd really love to make my day and uh, make me very happy, uh, please check out my Patreon. Um, it is in the description below. I'd also like to take the time now to thank everyone who helped me on this project. Uh, Wade Howie, Paul Hill, Doug McMillan, uh, basically everybody at Industrial Light and Magic. Uh, my mysterious benefactor who uh, got me that uh, copy of uh, Takuya Onuki's book. And of course, Noriko um, for her amazing voiceover performance and uh, all of the help that uh, she did with translating. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.